Whether you've been playing the Deadlight since Wrath, or if you're new to the spec due to that flavor of the month hype, then there'll be plenty of things for you to learn with the new and improved Cataclysm version of this spec. While undoubtedly being the strongest tank in Cataclysm by far, some Death Knights will seem like they're made out of paper, while others seemingly can sustain themselves without a healer and simply never die. Well, the aim of this video is to turn you into the latter. In this video, we'll be going over your stat priority, talents and glyphs, rotation, professions and race, weak R's and macros, along with some other aspects of the class to keep in mind. This guide is made assuming you have a base level understanding of the class, and will gloss over the most absolute basic information to focus on how to optimize your gameplay. And with that, here is your Cataclysm Guide to the Blood Death Knight. Stat-wise, there are a few routes you can go depending on what style of tank you want to be. But most people should be looking at taking a balanced gearing approach that trades small avoidance gains for huge damage and effective HP gains. And as such, I recommend going for stamina equal to mastery over hit cap, over soft expertise cap, over strength, over dodge, over parry, over haste, over hard expertise cap, over crit. Let's talk a little bit about why. Stamina is a much greater stat than people may think. If you've been perusing old forums, you may have heard of terms such as stamina cap and that stamina is useless after you can comfortably survive 2-3 hits. But that is an old and outdated way of looking at the game. Defensively, stamina provides you with the safety of being able to take big hits outside of your death strike windows. It's the only stat that provides any benefit against magical damage, and your healing plus absorbs from death strike will be larger whenever you're death striking with the minimal value. Offensively, you get approximately half of the attack power value you get from pure strength due to vengeance, whereas mastery would give you zero offensive value. Mastery, of course, is one of the reasons why the DK is so strong in this expansion. It gives us an absorption shield to physical attacks based on the healing from Death Strike. The absorb shield is 6.25% of the Death Strike heal per point of mastery, but already in previous gear, you'll have around 130% shield going. That means you'll generally want to go for the highest item level piece that has mastery and reforge the secondary stat according to your priority list. Speaking of priority lists, you may wonder why we pursue hit and expertise over dodge and parry. Dodge and parry has very poor scaling, and in a lot of cases, it'll be a benefit to actually take damage due to quicker stacking of vengeance and how the healing of Death Strike actually works. Thus, going for hit and expertise will provide you with more damage, threat, and will make sure that Outbreak never misses so you don't have to waste frost and unholy runes to reapply dots. In Wrath of the Lich King, your runes would be refunded if you missed or the boss dodged or parried your attacks. But this is not the case for Death Strikes in Cataclysm anymore. The healing will still go through, but your runes will go on cooldown. During heroic testing on the beta, I never felt the need for increased avoidance, but if you want to strictly focus on mitigation during progression, then you can bump down expertise on your priority list in order to focus on avoidance. Keep in mind though that tanks do competitive damage in Cataclysm and strictly going for defense will generally not be advised. Haste is also a very solid stat for Blood DKs both offensively and defensively since it increases the rate at which we regenerate runes. I would expect to see a lot of Blood DKs stacking mastery and haste while the raids are on farm. There are generally three talent builds that we can go for. One focus on progression rate tanking, one focus on AoE slash dungeon tanking, and one focus on damage slash parsing. Before we go into the builds, please do not follow any of the build guides from the old Elitist Jerks forums or the private server forums that include Lichborn in their build. Either the information is based on information that isn't from the 4.3.4 patch, or it's simply wrong. The idea is that you can pop Lichborn and start casting Death Coils on yourself with the Death's Embrace Glyph that refunds half the running power cost. But doing this will be absolute grief outside of niche circumstances where you are unable to attack a target, as runic power is much better spent to proc runic empowerment to death strike more as death coils only proc runic empowerment when it's cast on an enemy target. Not to mention the immense damage loss from using your globals and runic power on death coil healing along with all the valuable talent points you would give up in order to go down the frost tree. Alright. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the first build. This build we'll use as we head into progression, and for most people, it'll be your bread and butter build. 
Blood is one of those specs where you primarily want to stick to the blood tree while only picking up a few points in the other talent trees. On screen, you have the talents we'll go for, but let me quickly go over why we make the choices we do. Scent of Blood is extremely valuable for proccing extra runic power, so on single target encounters, we want to go for 3 out of 3 in this talent. But it loses value very quickly once you add more targets, but assuming you'll be raiding in this build, going for 3 out of 3 will be very worth it. You can absolutely forego using Abomination's Might if you're raiding in a 25 man group, as plenty of other classes will bring the attack power buff, and both Bug Cake Blade and Butchery provides more offensive value than the 2% strength buff. But not having the buff outside of raid content feels bad, so I opt to pick it up. Speaking of Blood Cake Blade and Butchery, we opt to skip them in this build as the damage benefit is very low and generally not worth the trade off from other talents. Blood Parasites bring huge healing to the raid and should always be picked up, even if your disc priest complains about atonement healing targeting the worms. The output is way higher than any potential lost healing from atonement. Crimson Scourge is an absolute must in your build. The damage from Blood Boil is negligible, but the free procs also grants you 10 runic power, which is huge as we will find ourselves with free globals quite often early in the expansion. We'll go down the Frost Tree to pick up 2 points in Runic Empowerment as we'll ideally want to play with a rather full Runic Power bar at all times. We'll talk a little bit more about why in the Glyph section. Then lastly, we pick up 3 points in Epidemic to make sure that our Dots is kept up 100% through solely using Outbreak. You could technically go 2 out of 3 here, which would make your Dots have a 29 second timer while Outbreak is on a 30 second cooldown. But I think the flexibility of not having to be forced to use Outbreak or Rise of Comps up cooldown every single time is worth the one point. The second build is a dungeon build aimed at increasing your damage output while farming heroics. This build sacrifices a few points in the blood tree in order to go deeper down the unholy tree to pick up 30% increased death and decay damage through morbidity. Combine that with Glyph of Death and Decay and Glyph of Heart Strike, and you'll be topping the damage meters in every single dungeon. This build may or may not see much use as most people are already done with the dungeon spamming process outside of capping out your weekly Valor points, but it's worth having as an off spec if you don't DPS by the time we get the Gamma Dungeon equivalent for this expansion. The third build is the Damage Slash Parse build. This build forgoes picking up Abomination's Might, Toughness and Scarlet Fever in favor of higher damage options like Blood Cake Blade, Butchery, 3 out of 3 runic power mastery, and a point in virulence. Obviously, you'll have to bribe your raid leader to have other people in the raid bring the buffs. But if you need to pick up Scarlet Fever as it's only brought by tanks, then drop 1 point in runic power mastery and 1 point in virulence to make that happen. This build will make you do about 1k more DPS, but will make you take slightly more damage due to not taking toughness. But the value from toughness is honestly not that big, so as long as you have other people in the raid bring the buffs, then feel free to run this build. And that brings us to the glyphs. For prime glyphs, you always want to run with glyph of heart strike for 30% increased damage and glyph of death strike, which grants you 2% increased damage for every 5 runic power you have, up to a maximum of 40%. This is the reason why we ideally want to play around a high runic power pool and not dump all of our runic power unless absolutely required. 40% additional damage on Death Strike is enormous as it's our biggest hitting ability by far. For the third glyph, we swap between Glyph of Rune Strike for single target and Glyph of Death and Decay for dungeons and AoE. For our major glyphs, I like Glyph of Bone Shield and Anti Magic Shell as staples for all content. For the third glyph, there aren't too many great options. Glyph of Vampiric Blood is bait as the heal increase portion does not apply to Death Strike, and in my opinion, the 15% health increase is more valuable as a tool to save you from sticky situations than the additional 15% healing received is. Glyph of Pestilence has limited use in a raiding scenario, and Glyph of Dancing Room Weapon should generally provide limited value as you will not be struggling with threat. That being said, out of all of the options, I think this is the strongest option as it will act as a bit of a safeguard in case you're very unlucky with parries in your opener. Minor glyphs doesn't really matter. I personally use Glyph of Blood Tap, Glyph of Horn of Winter, and Glyph of Brazilian Grip as I find these have the most value. Your opener will almost always look like this. One minute before the fight, if possible, we use Bone Shield, 
10 seconds before the fight, we use Army of the Dead if you won't need it as a defensive during the fight. 2 seconds before the fight, use Horn of Winter. 1 second before the fight, use Strength Potion, then Taunt, Death Strike, Heart Strike, Death Strike. If you didn't Army on Pull, use Heart Strike again, then use a macro with Engineering Tinker, Racial, Potential Offensive Trinket, and Dancing Rune Weapon when you're at Max Vengeance. Outbreak, Death Strike if available, and if you want to use your Empowered Rune Weapon offensively, then now would be the time. At this point, we go into our normal rotation. While the way we press our spells is generally referred to as a rotation, like most other classes, the Death Knight has a priority-based system where you press your spells based on your resource regeneration and what the encounter calls for. But generally, our priority will look like this. Keep dots on the target at all times through Outbreak. Get at least one rune of each type on cooldown to trigger the regeneration of each rune. Prioritize using Death Strike, Heart Strike only with Blood Runes, Convert a Blood Rune into a Death Rune to use Death Strike when you have one Death Rune available and make sure the Blood Rune is on cooldown before Blood Tapping. Stay at a high runic power level and use Rune Strike whenever we are at or above 100 runic power. Use Blood Boil procs whenever you have an empty global. Now, there are two schools of thought when it comes to Death Strike usage. One is to maximize the amount of Death Strikes per minute by simply pressing it as it's available. This has the benefit of increasing your overall damage done, but comes with the trade-off of lower healing and mitigation. Death Strike healing in Cataclysm is based on the damage you're taking, healing you for 20% of the damage taken in the preceding 5 seconds or a minimum of 7% of your maximum health. That means there can be huge variability in how much you heal with Death Strike and will thus greatly affect your absorbs through mastery. The second school of thought is to be more methodical about your Death Strike usage and to use a weak aura to track how big your heal is going to be in order to time your Death Strike properly to maximize the healing and absorption gain. A skilled player can become pretty much invincible by playing this way. But it does have the downside of you casting less overall spells per minute as you can at times sit with runes off cooldown. It comes down to how comfortable you are with the class and how much of an issue survivability is to you and your raid. Our AoE rotation is rather similar. We open with Death and Decay, get 60 running power through Death Strike and Heart Strike, Dancing Rune Weapon, Outbreak and Pestilence while we go into our normal rotation of using Death Strike with Death Runes and Heart Strike or Blood Boil with Blood Runes. If you don't have Dancing Rune Weapon up, then use Death and Decay, Outbreak, Pestilence and then go into your normal rotation. When it comes to choosing between Heart Strike and Blood Boil, you may think that you want to use Blood Boil whenever there are more than 3 targets, as Heart Strike only affects 3 targets. But from a damage perspective, that is not the case. If AoE Snap Threat is not an issue, which it never is if you have Death and Decay active, then I would only Blood Boil if there are 8 or more targets that your Blood Boil can hit. If you're worried about threat on targets not hit by your Heart Strike, you can tab through target to target between each Heart Strike to spread the damage. When it comes to professions, the philosophy has changed quite a bit from back in the days when it was recommended to go jewel crafting and blacksmithing. I will not be recommending either of those professions for Death Knights in Cataclysm. While your second profession makes less of a difference, the first one is an absolute no-brainer, and that is Engineering. The Glove Tinker, Nitro Boost, Parachute, and perfectly statted helmet that won't be replaced until you get a replacement from Heroic Rating makes it far better than any of the other professions. Yes, Nitro Boost can fail in this expansion, but fail rates are still very low. Even so, as a DK, you can ensure that it becomes a non-issue with Anti-Magic Shield. We just have to use it a bit more sparingly than we did in Wrath. You may look at the Tinker and say that a 12 second buff with 1500 armor doesn't seem that strong, and you'd be right. But even as tanks, we'll be running with sign up springs due to how strong it is for snapshotting our dancing room weapon. You'll still be using bombs and sappers in Cataclysm, even if they are less impactful than in previous expansions. Not to mention having a parachute cloak for that dreaded elevator boss in Blackwing Descent. Your second option will depend a bit on where you find yourself in the expansion as well as how sweaty you are. Ideally, we'll want to run with Alchemy before heading into Rogue Raiding to pick up Lifebound Alchemy Stone. You also get the benefit of getting 120 extra stamina when using a Stamina Flask and 80 extra Strength when using a Strength Flask. After getting a replacement trinket, we'll want to drop Alchemy in favor of Leatherworking. 
Since Cataclysm didn't bring with it any new stamina enchant to Bracers, the best stamina option available to us is the plus 40 enchant from Wrath of the Lich King. And since the leatherworking Bracer enchant gives us 195 stamina, that makes it the most beneficial secondary profession. While the benefit may seem small, you also get access to greater drums of speed, which grants the raid 15% movement speed for 30 seconds. A lot of classes have this 15% built into their toolkit, but it can at times come in clutch. Of course, if you don't have the funds to go around swapping professions mid-expansion, then simply go with leatherworking all the way. While I don't think any race is worth rerolling for or to spend your hard-earned money to race transfer to, there are definite benefits to being one race over another. Let's start with Horde. You may think that Tauren is the way to go due to that 5% increase in base health, but that is absolute bait. The bonus does not scale with Vengeance and has very limited defensive value. The decision comes down to if you want mobility or damage. Damage-wise, Troll is the best race due to Berserking, especially with it now resetting after each fight. Snapshotting the buff with Dancing Rune Weapon gives a ton of value. Not far behind is Orc, but in full Biss, it sims around 100 DPS below Troll. For mobility, which DKs are sorely lacking, we'll run with Goblin. But the difference is about 600 DPS in full Biss, which is definitely something to consider. For Alliance, the decision is between mobility and defense. For the most damage and a 40% sprint, we go for Worgen, but for another defensive cooldown in our already stacked defensive arsenal, we go with Dwarf. There are quite a few weak guards which allows us to be better as tanks and players in general. I will link to all the ones that I use in the description below. It's important to run with a Vengeance Tracker so you know when to pop your Dancing Burn Weapon and Outbreak in your opener. I think a bar is far superior to numerical values I see some people using, as it will give you the information you need through your peripheral vision. You should have a Death Strike Tracker, which gives you a calculation on how big your Death Strike, Shield, and Heal is. I have a very rudimentary lightweight version, which I wouldn't be opposed to switching if I found a better one. In addition to that, get a Blood Shield Tracker for your Death Strikes that includes how big your current shield is along with the timer so you don't let the buff time out before refreshing. You should track your trinkets if you have unused trinkets. You should have a class weak aura that brings all the important information to the center so you can easily track your runes, runic power, dot uptime, and cooldowns all in one area where your eyes should be focused. In a right setting, you should make sure to have a weak aura that shows you the name of the target on your nameplate, especially if you don't have altering colors on nameplates depending on threat. Speaking of nameplates, I'm using a modified version of Cow's Plater Profile. But you may use any nameplate add-on of your choosing, but I would recommend making sure you have a few things included in your health bar. First, make sure to have at least three colors set to your bars. One for when you're tanking the target, one for when your off tank is tanking the target, and one for when it's running loose on the DPS. Green, purple, and red have never failed me. Second, make sure to have a target indicator. When there are a lot of mobs, things can get messy, and having a target indicator will make life a lot easier. Then lastly, make sure to have large color-coded cast bars. There's nothing worse than seeing people try to interrupt uninterruptible spells or simply not interrupting at all because they can't see the cast bar. Macro-wise, there's not that much that's necessary in Cataclysm, but a few comes to mind. Having a mouse over macro for your combat rest is important, even if you won't be the go-to person for combat resting. You could also get some value from having a mouse over death crit macro and a raised dead plus death pact sequence macro. But the most important macro is your Dancing Rune Weapon macro, where you'll want to make sure to use your Engineering Tinker, Racial, Potential Offensive Trinkets unless they share cooldown with your Tinker, and of course Dancing Rune Weapon. In this last section, I want to rapidly go over some things that will be important to keep in mind. First is consumables. We run with Stamina Flask, we use Mastery Food for Progression, Strength Food for Farm, and don't be the guy that eats the feast which gives you stamina and dodge. We use strength potions generally, but you can change your second pot to an armor pot if the fight calls for it, but always pre-pot with strength. 
For our gems, we generally run with 60 stamina, but most of the time, we opt for the socket bonus if we gain value from it. Stamina and Mastery for green gems, and Stamina Expertise for purple gems. When it comes to Stone Skin Gargoyle versus Fallen Crusader, I would run with Stone Skin Gargoyle for first progression rate to gauge how comfortable I am with the raid while either sticking with Gargoyle until the end of progression or go Fallen Crusader right away. The damage increase is huge from Fallen Crusader and Stone Skin Gargoyle offers limited defensive utility. Don't go with Ruin of Sword Chattering. Lastly, please make sure to track your external raid cooldowns. Even though you're equipped with a ton of personal cooldowns, utilizing externals for big hitting abilities will still be very valuable. Give your teammates some time to react to the call and call their name before asking for the cooldown. Chances are, if you say Pain Suppression Me, you'll either get two at once or zero if they don't know who quote unquote me is. If you've stuck around till the end, I want to thank you so much for watching. Plenty of more DK and tank content is to come, like Feral Druid, Prop Warrior, and Prop Paladin guides. So if you get some value from what I do, then make sure to subscribe. But that's all for now. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time.